Good morning, everyone. I will speak in, in English. Dear colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to the discussion Protecting Journalists, Protecting Democracy, hosted by the Present Information Office as part of the Council of Europe's campaign Journalists Matter, which will run from 2023 to 2027. This campaign is an opportunity for all member states to go a few steps further towards free and pluralistic media, quality news, a healthy media ecosystem, and healthy democratic processes and societies. As we, as we are all aware, the safety of journalists is recognized at the international level as a precondition for freedom of expression and democracy. That's why we are grateful that the Council of Europe has trusted the present information office to launch this campaign for the protection and safety of journalists from Cyprus. Before I give the floor to our speakers, I would like to recall that the decision to carry out a comprehensive campaign at the European level dedicated to the promotion of the protection of journalism and the safety of journalists was taken at the Conference of Ministers Responsible for Media and Information Society, which was organized by the present information office here in Nicosia in June 2021. At the said conference, ministers discussed solutions against the dangerous backsliding in the area of the safety of journalists, and with a resolution renewed their commitment to make the protection of journalists an urgent political priority. Today, at the launching of the campaign, we are honored by the presence of Mr. Patrick Penix, head of the Information Society Department of the Council of Europe, of Mr. Matthew Garland Galicia, the director of the play They Blew Her Up, and of Mr. Herman Grech, the editor-in-chief of the Times of, of Malta. I directed the play. I would like to ask Mr. Patrick Penix to take the floor and present us the concept and the objectives of the campaign, Journalists Matter. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Ilika. And good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to see so many of you here today. Journalists matter. Our matter. Your matter. We matter. I think it is extremely important not only to claim that journalism is necessary for a democratic society, but it's also important to be able to put that in practice. And in many cases, we had a an evaluation, I think this works, no? we had an evaluation of 10 years of action of the United Nations, UNESCO, Action Plan on the Protection of Journalists. We had 25 years existence of the representative of the freedom of the media uh, in, with the OSCE in Europe. Unfortunately, the reality has gone past the expectations when it comes to the hope that within our democratic societies we would be able to have a free, reliable journalism. Attacks comes from many, many sides. Not in the least in a number of our states, the 46 member states of the Council of Europe, 
not in the least from the governments themselves, because free and independent journalism is not necessarily what is required and wanted. That has led to a number of mishaps, serious mishaps, crimes, horrendous crimes, in the Council of Europe member states, in the European Union member states, and we will hear more about it in a few minutes. That is why the Council of Europe decided that we would set up not again another campaign, but try to enforce what already exists, not to look at what everything that goes wrong. We have to know that, but that has been repeated um, in a number of occasions already that we continue to say what is going wrong, but we haven't focused enough on what we can do to make it better. And the launch of this campaign here today is extremely important in this, in this manner. We will first and foremost have to establish mechanisms that really respond to giving an opportunity to journalists which are under attack which are um, slandered, uh, which are criminalized to be able to protect themselves. We have a number of tools which are already available, but we need to make sure that those tools are also going to be implemented. And therefore, it has to be a mechanism that is not going to be from one partner only. It's not only the government. It's not only the judiciary that will be able to do and put this into place. We need to be able to do it with the journalistic community itself, with the media community itself. Bringing that together in order to have safe havens for journalists to be able to do their work. Our Secretary General has in a number of occasions already said that without a free pluralistic media, and journalists that can report on matters that go wrong, we do not have a democracy. It's sometimes difficult. It is sometimes um, not easy for governments to be able to confront themselves with those realities, but it is necessary in our democratic societies. We've seen with the war in Ukraine right now how much disinformation has become part of warfare. And when uh, independent, reliable sources and voices are being extinguished, at that moment in time, we slide off to totalitarian regimes. This has an introduction uh, to what I will present in a few minutes uh, on the campaign that we are launching today here in Cyprus, uh, a Europe-wide campaign um, that will cover all the member states of the 46 Council of Europe states, but which will also have an international echo because we work together with international institutions such as UNESCO, the United Nations, um, but also the OSCE, the European Commission, in order to make this a reality, and primarily also with our national uh, governments and national journalist organizations in order to make this a reality. This is to say that, in fact, we're back home because two years ago, almost two years ago, um, we had a ministerial conference which was attended here in, in Nicosia. Unfortunately, online, because we were still all wearing masks two years ago, um, which was held with the participation of more than 47 ministers of the member states of the Council of Europe with international prominent figures that were taking part in this and which declared and made a resolution on the necessity to launch such a campaign. And here we are. We're starting. Maybe you will say it took a long time for you to get ready, but I think it is important that we are well prepared in order to not to repeat maybe the mistakes that were made before and probably make other mistakes again uh, in order to advance when it comes to the protection of journalists. So I will slide, quickly go through this. If you need details, 
If you need details about this, obviously the PowerPoint presentation that I will make is going to be available to you. Uh, you can share it, you can take up the details uh, if you're going to report about this or uh, going to work on it afterwards. So, Council of Europe, um, I, I actually, I must say that uh, I hope that we can, we can use the uh, logo that has been developed in Cyprus on Journalists Matter, Our Matter. It's, it's extremely speaking for itself, it's very much speaking for itself, so we really hope to be able to use this also uh, in the future, so thank you very much for that. So, I'll say a few words about uh, the background, the objectives, what we, the target groups, uh, the added value uh, of the Council of Europe in this and a roadmap, but also what we uh, want to uh, commit as actions, uh, what the expected results would be, um, and we'll take, talk a little bit more about that. Journalists play a vital role in safeguarding democratic, pluralistic society. It's also recognized by the European Court of Human Rights. Journalists are public watchdogs. Watchdogs for, I don't like the word watchdog though, but uh, okay, uh, let's use it for now. Um, people which are anchored into looking at what those realities are and report on it. Not always easy. And we'll know more about it afterwards, about people paying with their lives to be able to report. There's a number of uh, recommendations that already exist. Maybe one thing to mention is that the Council of Europe established a couple of years ago, five, seven years ago in the meantime, a platform for international journalist organizations to be able to alert the Council of Europe governments uh, to what is happening in the different countries. Those alerts, even though they're only um, flagstones or maybe only indications and not a full picture of what is going wrong, but at least there are indications that international journalist organizations, freedom of expression organizations, human rights organizations can flag to the governments what the issues are and what is going wrong in a number of our member states, in the 46 member states. And the first thing to see is that it does not only happen in the countries which are the traditional uh, countries which you would say, well, yeah, it was to be expected that in those countries there would be a number of, um, um, let's say, deviations from freedom of expression, but it happens all over in the very heart of the European Union and in the very heart of the Council of Europe member states. None are exempt from it. And that is important to flag as well. I mentioned the resolution that was adopted here in Nicosia. I like to call it the Nicosia resolution because it was adopted here. It was adopted here. The campaign was initially launched here at the ministerial conference by saying, this is important, this is an important uh, issue that we need to continue to look at. What do we want to do? We, of course, we want to increase the safety of journalists and, and other media actors in all situations from all violations, including the ones that are novel because the counter actors of, um, of freedom of expression are numerous. They have numerous tools. They go from slander to murder, from online harassment to lawsuits. So let's not forget about this and make sure that we have to cover the protection of journalists in all of those situations. We want to promote campaigns at national level that change the situation, provide help, but also provide guidelines on how can we make sure that a mechanism is created at a national level to be able to ensure that reality, where different stakeholders are part of it. So we will uh, target um, 
not only journalists and press council, media outlets, but also public officials, justice, the courts, the civil society, uh, including relevant independent human rights initiatives, to play a crucial role in campaigning for that safety to more effectively and actively contribute to the journalist uh, safety. But also to improve the, the quality of the policies and the legislation in place and the practices. We're going through, I'm not going to read out too much about the roadmap, but here we are at an initial phase. And I think it is important to say that we don't want to call it a one-off thing. It's not just this today that it happens. Today is a start. But we want to ensure that over time, and we know that in a number of countries we will need more time than in others in order to establish such a mechanism that will protect. We, we take a time lapse of four to five years, which is rather realistic in terms of setting up the necessary mechanisms. In a number of countries, there are already uh, a number of mechanisms in place, and we need to build on those. Maybe they have some good practices, or practices that we can look at and, and see if those are replicable or not. So we want to work around four pillars, prevention, protection, prosecution, and promotion. Promotion of information, education, awareness raising, media liter literacy. Organized by states, but not only by the states, by the mechanisms that we will put in place, awareness raising, and so on. We will coordinate at, at the level of the Council of Europe, but we also expect a national coordination to take place, national campaign committee, which will result in a mechanism to uh, enforce uh, international and national legislation. The key partners, uh, I mentioned them already, that is our platform for the protection of journalists, but also the international institutions the uh, other relevant stakeholders, journalists, maybe also journalists, schools for journalism. I think it is important to involve them as well from the very start. That is that we create an awareness about the risks that are there, um, but also about the opportunities journalists, journalism brings and how it can be better promoted. I already mentioned already uh, as well the thematic events on protection, prosecution, prevention, promotion. Each of them are important. It's not only a question of protecting journalists. It's also ensuring that um, when crimes are committed against journalists, that they are being prosecuted, that they are being brought to justice. I think that's extremely important, and we will hear also, I'm sure, a bit more about that in the case of Malta and uh, in the case of Daphne Caruana Galizia. Prevent, promote, and promotion becomes increasingly important because we are right now in the age of complete, total disinformation and propaganda. I think it is important that we uh, ensure that our all generations, not only the, 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 the children or kids which are in school, but also the older generation is increasingly aware of the new tools that out, are out there for this information um, and even propaganda, state propaganda, which I thought was a thing of the past, quite frankly. I thought this was the 30s of the last century. But we see how much impact systemic state disinformation and propaganda has on people even today. And the tools that are available, whether that be the algorithmic creation of bubbles around us, which lead to actually information that can be guided. The, the, the new uh, elements such as uh, chat GPT, which can be used not only for the good but also for the bad. 
the narratives that can be created, I think it's in, incredibly important that we, we, we learn and that we ensure that we disseminate, disseminate this information uh, also to all types, all generations. We've recently published a study on, on the, uh, um, the media and information literacy for seniors. Very often they're completely left out. I always consider myself as a junior senior, uh, and and in that, I I I have not been. I was not born and raised with uh, with media literacy. I was not born and raised with all the tools that we now have in our pockets. So I think it is incredibly important to also promote that in the future. We will go through those national chapters, create best practices and visibility tools. We hope to create a real impact. Um, um, how do you measure that? The indicators right now are going down. So let's hope to at least halt the fact that crimes against journalism, uh, against, against journalists are diminished, at least stabilized. It's hor horrendous no, to think that we, we need killings in our societies of journalists in order to create some kind of awareness in, in our societies. It's, um, I wouldn't have expected it to be possible in Western European democracies that journalists, because of their engagement, are uh, targeted. But it's the reality. So we also want to put forward the positive role of journalists because we like to play, pay lip service to it. That is to say, oh, well, journalists are important for the uh, uh, preservation of our democratic systems. But it's not sufficient to pay lip service. I think it is important to, to go beyond that, way beyond that. Cons uh, also to create a culture of, of constructive dialogue in this. Visibility material, of course, as we've seen here with Journalist Matter, it's already... I, I hope that we will be able to use and that also the journalists that are here in the room today will be able to use the material that has been uh, developed by the Press and Information Office um, to create this feeling of we're all working towards that very same goal. Okay, this is more coordination. Uh, I think that's at the level of the Council of Europe. I don't think that is really important for you. What we hope to do is to create this in the 46 member states. As you know, last year in March, uh, one country was expelled from the Council of Europe, which was the Russian Federation. But we will continue to ensure that the alerts of both the Russian Federation and also of Belarus are being reported. And we had a workshop uh, only last week in, with Belarusian journalists in exile. The Council of Europe has taken an unprecedented decision. Many these days, expelling a member state, Russian Federation, but also deciding to work together with a government in exile. For an intergovernmental institution, this is completely novel. And I think it is important that we continue to watch not only what's happening in our countries, but also in Belarus and the Russian Federation, and try to ensure that we, we do this all together. That is, that's it for me. I have one thing to do, and I would like to invite a spokesperson <coughs> of the government to uh, hand over a, a very small token of appreciation for the uh, the launch of the campaign and in fact it is the official stamp of the campaign that he can use on all of his official documents to protect journalists so thank you very much thank you that is Topoli. thank you
So, uh, raising awareness and informing the public of the importance of ensuring the safety of journalists is a way to defend the very essence of a pluralistic democracy. I will now give the floor to Mr. Matthew Garwana Galicia, a journalist and director of the Daphne Garwana Galicia Foundation. Inspired by his mother's journalism and an wavering commitment to the public interest, he continues her fight for press freedom and against corruption and impunity. We are really honored that Matthew and the talented group of artists have traveled to Cyprus to perform for us just for one night for the launching of the campaign Journalists Matter in Cyprus and help us spread the message that the protection of journalists really concerns us all. Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you. You put a lot of weight on my shoulders. I, I, I cannot fight for press freedom alone. Um, but luckily, ever since my mom was assassinated in 2017, um, people have really rallied around the, the fight for justice. And that includes other journalists like Herman and um, many others in Malta, people who are activists, some politicians as well. So that was, that is what has enabled us to, to get so far in, in our fight. But we still have quite a long way to go. Um, the first question I, I get asked, asked is where are things in Malta? So I thought I'll start with that. Um, the, the assassination was in October 2017. Right after that, uh, thanks to the assistance of the FBI who happened to be in Malta on a training exercise, the hitmen who put the bomb in, in my mother's car were arrested. And they were only convicted a few months ago. So the trial took more than five years. Um, which, which is really incredible, but it's just, uh, uh, it just represents the state of affairs in Malta, that even when you have a really solid case, it takes so long to get justice. And of course, for my mother's family, that means going to court every week, um, being involved in the investigation, dealing with all of the responses that your lawyers have to make to legal actions taken by the defense all this kind of thing. So it really, um, it, it really does feel like you have a lot of weight on your shoulders. It's a huge responsibility. And the fact that um, so many other people um, see your fight as being representative of their own also means you have even more added responsibility. Um, the, the, the person who is accused of masterminding the murder is also in custody, but his trial hasn't started yet. Um, it should start sometime towards the end of this year. And there are also other people who are being prosecuted for supplying the bomb. So with, with all of these people, we would have, you would say, um, a complete cast of characters involved in the murder who are in custody. But we consider that to be only a part of our fight because my mother's assassination is deeply linked to corruption in Malta. And so far we have yet to see any kind of justice for that corruption which my mother was investigating and exposing. Um, right at the beginning of the assassination, I mean my brothers and I, I have two brothers, we're very close in age, we were very private people um, I didn't consider myself to be a campaigner or to be a public person or to be an act activist or advocate of any kind. Um, even though I spent years working in journalism, my name never appeared anywhere. And I, w I was very happy with that because I was mostly helping journalists in the background. But we were forced to speak out because um, uh, a key point of our, our government's sort of public relations activity 
was that my mother was my mother's assassination was was a freak incident um, that she was murdered by people who were involved in low-level organized crime um, oil trafficking in the Mediterranean and this rumor was put about quite successfully at the beginning so we decided okay we have to speak out the murder is not linked um, to kind of low-level organized criminal groups it's linked to high-level corruption so we started speaking out a few days after the murder to kind of counteract this kind of disinformation that was actually coming from the government itself um, and we also had to educate I guess or inform people around Europe including politicians heads of international organizations that actually the state of affairs in Malta is really bad and it has come to this point because of corruption it was very difficult for politicians or um, senior people within organizations like the UN to understand how something like this could happen in a member state of the European Union so the first thing they thought of was okay this journalist was murdered as part of a kind of vendetta maybe she wrote something about someone that um, was really offended and this person wanted revenge so that's that's why she was murdered but actually what we tried really hard to communicate especially in the first few years is that the number one cause of murders of journalists is corruption most journalists who are murdered are murdered during their investigations into high level corruption or into political affairs and it was the same for my mother the difference was that this was the first time in, in years that this had happened in the European Union so we just weren't used to it whereas in many other countries it is a matter of course that journalists are murdered during such investigations I think what, what really began to worry um, a lot of senior politicians around Europe is when a few months after my mother was assassinated another investigative journalist was murdered in Slovakia Jan Kusiak and then after that yet another and then another in Greece so it, it just seemed like things were getting out of control and this has spurred on campaigns for justice and accountability but also looking at how we can change systems to prevent these murders in the first place now one thing which my family says over and over again is that to stop these attacks and to, to stop murders we have to work hard to stop corruption unless we tackle corruption head on these murders are going to keep happening so the kind of protections that we are discussing now in the European Union um, protecting journalists from abusive legal proceedings slaps where journalists are sued abusively not because the person who is suing them has a genuine case but just because they want to harass the journalist um, better access to information campaigns against disinformation these things are crucial they're really important but what is key to us I mean what is the core issue is the fight against corruption this is a, this is at the core of our campaign in Malta but we recognize that for small member states like Malta and Cyprus in a world where corruption is is very transnational um, where politicians businesses use bank accounts in different countries I mean in the Caribbean Switzerland the United Arab Emirates companies in the British Virgin Islands to move money around the world it is very difficult for member states acting alone to fight this kind of international network of corruption so we are also advocating at the EU level for better tools that authorities can use to investigate and, and prosecute corrupt actors um, it is really for us the way we look at it um, a matter of catching up with the way journalists have been working for the past 10 years I would say um, when I started out I mean when I was studying journalism the world of data 
was really unknown to most journalists, and I think Herman would agree to this as, as an editor of many years. But what has happened over the past decade is that the way journalists use access to not just information that is in the public domain, but closed sources like leaks, like the Panama Papers and Swiss leaks, has really accelerated our ability to share um, these kinds of this kind of information, these kinds of leaks, has grown exponentially over the past couple of years. And with these kinds of investigations, journalists are increasingly working together. Journalists in Colombia, working with journalists in Malta, journalists in Italy, working with those in Greece. So we have become really effective at investigating corrupt networks, criminal groups, official corruption. But authorities still, I believe, have to catch up with this way of intense collaborative working. Um, and that means that journalists are at greater risk in the interim. Because if, if we are the ones who are kind of pushing the boundaries and really holding, um, exposing criminal groups or holding corrupt actors to account, then we are very heavily exposed. If prosecutors are not following up on our work, if police aren't investigating properly, um, if businesses and politicians are suing us when we come out with our investigations, then yes, journalists are going to remain exposed. So what matters, I mean, as Patrick said, is that of course we go beyond the lip service and these kinds of words are translated into real action against corruption and in favor of justice when journalists reveal what is really going on. Thank you. I now go to our guest, Mr. Hermann Grech, uh, an award-winning journalist and playwright. He is the editor-in-chief of the Times of Malta and a prominent campaigner for human rights and anti-hate speech. Hermann Grech was among a small number of journalists who investigated the murder of Daphne Garuana Galicia. Mr. Grech. Hi, um, good morning. I'll try to keep my intervention a bit short because I would really like to maybe include you in, in the discussion because uh, we're always he here to also learn from you and uh, to get your perspective of things. Um, Patrick at one point mentioned the, the, the 1930s, how this is not the 1930s, but the methods have changed. The attacks are still the same. You know, we're in, in Nazi Germany, you had Goebbels talking about uh, the mainstream media and the lies of the mainstream media, and the Nazis systematically started closing down uh, newspapers at the time. Um, there were, I believe, some 5,000 newspapers, daily newspapers, and by the time the regime fell, there were about 1,000 papers. Um, and they managed, through the most brutal ways, to convince the people there that the mainstream media, because that's what Goebbels used to say, uh, is the common enemy. Now, we might not be living in those times, thank goodness, but the methods are become, have become a bit more nuanced now. You know, the attacks happen in different ways. So we move on 80, 90 years, and you have the likes of uh, Bolsonaro, of Viktor Orban in, in, in Hungary, and more recently Donald Trump, who portrays the media as the enemy. These are the enemy of the people, you know. You are, they are the enemy, and I'm telling you they are the enemy in the so-called national interest. How many times have we heard that term, the national interest? In Malta, we're like hearing, that term, although we're doing it in the national interest, it's, we're doing it in your interest. And the media is on the other side, protecting the elite, whoever they may be. The media is there protecting uh, um, what is not in the national interest. And when you have the discourse coming from the governments, 
and from the authorities. And it piggybacks of right-wing populist sentiments. You have a recipe for disaster. And unfortunately, I think this is where, in my country, you know, before I used to, um, whenever I told people that I came from Malta, it used to be, oh, that's where you have that shitty football team, yeah, where you always lose to everybody. Uh, nowadays, wherever I go, I was in Cyprus just a couple of years ago, and I was eating at a restaurant, and uh, we, you know, the person next to us, uh, he turned to me and said, what's the language? And, and you know, we got talking about Malta and all that. And before he left, he told me, and please stop killing journalists. I didn't even know what I did. And for me, that is incredible how we are forever associated with one of the most heinous crimes of our generation. And as Matthew mentioned, there was a narrative, a very dangerous narrative being played that we only got to know about it, I admit, even as an editor. We got to know about it later after Matthew's mother was assassinated. Now, not only did they kill a journalist, but they eventually tried to cover it up. They, there were the institutions that were literally, at best, not doing anything, or at, you know, at worst, doing their utmost so that the truth doesn't come out. And that's what made me believe even more in the importance of journalism, of independent journalism. Because journalists have a crucial role to play in bringing out the stories that others are really trying their utmost to cover up. Now, when you are constantly being bombarded by media, by, by, sorry, by the governments, by, by authoritarian regimes, that do it in different ways. They don't do it like Nazi Germany, but they instead they go into, we're seeing it happening in Poland at the moment uh, and in Hungary. You've got these, these oligarchs that go in and buy a newspaper and suddenly all the independent journalists are out. And instead of having 60% uh, uh, independent newspapers, you end up with 10, 20% of, of a big countries like Poland and Hungary being run uh, by basically government propaganda machines. And uh, the minute we start thinking, oh, but that happens in Eastern Europe, uh, the, the sooner we realize we're going down a slippery slope. Because some of the things I have seen in my own country that I consider to be a democratic country have shocked me to the core, have shocked a lot of people to the core. You know? When as Matthew said, you know, there is one person at the moment being um, accused of masterminding his, his mother's murder. But I'm one of those who believes that it was a system that killed Daphne. It was a system of corruption that has been happening right our noses, underneath our noses, and we have been turning a blind eye. Now, if journalists don't step in to try to expose what's happening behind the scenes, then we are uh, in, a, in a very dangerous place. And, uh, you know, this is why I always keep saying, even, I, I know that there are some journalists here, don't just go there and just report and just say, you know, someone say the sky is blue and someone say the sky is gray. No, sometimes we need to go out and check ourselves whether the sky is blue or gray and speak out defend the interests of journalists. There are machines happening, uh, you know, ma machines being operated and they're being wheeled and they're out of our control. You know, Twitter is not what it used to be a, a year ago. You know, there are different things. It's run by somebody who I personally think can lead to very dangerous results. You know, and us journalists love, love using Twitter. So speak up whenever there is something wrong. When there are governments that are clamping down on our rights, we need to say this is wrong, and you need to say why this is wrong. We're going to be criticized. We're going to be slammed. I mean, on social media, you know, I think some of us, you know, get the, get the shit daily. I, I, I mean, I go on Facebook sometimes and say, like, 
uh, you know, this is awful. There are trolls, there are troll machines who are there to attack you. But it is in our interest to make sure that we fight for, what, for the truth. Because, you know, it, we, we will not have soldiers marching in and closing in our newspapers. But there are much more effective means of silencing you. And uh, unfortunately, this is happening in the most democratic countries in the world. You know, who'd ever thought we'd be seeing a US president calling CNN the enemy of the people and pointing to a journalist in the crowd and throwing them out of the press room on the White House. That is, that is outrageous uh, when, when you think about it. So this is why we need to find our ways and means of speaking out as journalists, as activists, whatever you want, whatever you're doing in, in life. Don't just sit back and say, this will never happen to us. Because the minute you're, you're, you're you know, sitting idle, this is when the attacks really happen. And this is why I, I personally felt I had to write this play that we're going to be performing here in, in Nicosia tomorrow night. Because I needed an avenue where to almost express my anger at what happened in, in the country. Where I needed to export the story of what happened to Daphne Caruana Galizia, not only just what happened to her, but about the system which killed her. And uh, I would like to invite you, if, if you're free tomorrow night, to come and uh, watch um, this story. Not, it's not, because it's not just a story which happens in Malta. This is something which is happening all over Europe. So thank you very much for inviting us, guys. Thank you. Thank you all. Floor for comments or any questions, please. Yes. yes hello. Please state your name and question. This is Laura, this the Cyprus News Digest. I've got two points I'd like to ask you about. One is, it actually was brought up by everybody, I think, and that is media literacy, because People, certainly in Cyprus, I think it's fair to say a lot of the journalists here would agree, they just swallow whatever they read. And then we come to something that I find problematic, and that is that our parliament at the moment is discussing legislation that will curb, they're talking about misinformation and disinformation, but it may well also include journalists and therefore it's in a sense I see it as a potential protection particularly for political persons here to silence journalists who have legitimate criticisms. I'd like your comments on that. I, I can say a few things. Um, first of all of course media literacy is core. I, does it work? The, yes. the echo? Um, Media, media literacy is core to the business. That is that we uh, need to not only enforce that at the level of the, the schooling system, for example. I think there, in a number of countries, we're advancing quite well uh, in making young people aware because where do we get our news from? That's from our mobile phones. And I think most of us are in the same situation, that the first and foremost is that we are going to watch the news on, on our mobile phones. That's the first thing that at least I, I... So we need to be able to ensure that we can uh, have a critical view and vision of the news that is being offered to us. And that we need to be able to do that at all in, with all generations of society. I think that's extremely important because the, the tools that are in place right now, the algorithmic determination of the news that you're getting, etc., is extremely powerful. Um, and therefore, incredibly important to be able to decipher that. And um, what we've seen, especially during the COVID crisis uh, and the isolation of people, that the, elder, the older generation was particularly hard hit by that. So it is extremely important to, to be able to cover all generations with regards to the media literacy on the one thing. 
Now, I can't judge or uh, on the, the, the discussions that are currently taking place in the Cypriot parliament. I, d I don't have enough information about that. What I do see is that we have in a number of countries um, the reaction also due to the crisis situation that we've been living in. And during crisis, the Council of Europe has done quite a bit of work during media in crisis situations because the tendency is exactly that, national protection. We should, we should make sure that the, let's say, the, the, the discourse uh, remains in one line, in a way. And we don't need critical voices about this. And in quite a number of our countries, um, Herman mentioned Poland and Hungary, but unfortunately they're not the only countries. They're not the only countries in which this is taking place. Other countries which are older uh, member states of the, Council, of the Council of Europe and of the European Union are facing exactly the same thing. And that's why uh, at the level of the European Commission um, and the European Union, there is the elaboration of the Media Freedom Act uh, and the Rule of Law Report in which media, which is not traditionally an area of the European Union becomes increasingly important in order to look at how can the democratic institutions through free journalism be protected so that they can highlight not only corruption, money laundering, quite a number of uh, mishaps in society, the, uh, the diminishing of the dependence of, ju of, uh, of uh, justice, uh, which is a, a key problem in quite a number of countries with regards to the nomination of judges, the nominations of the high courts, etc., etc. So these are the issues that we need to be able to, to continue to uh, uh, keep an eye on. Um, we are doing that at the level of the Council of Europe, primarily with the, with the so-called um, countries which aspire to become a member state of the European Union. And we have a very close look at what's happening in Ukraine and what's happening in Georgia and what's happening in Armenia. But we sometimes forget that within the European Union countries, we need to have the same critical look. Of course, a country that has become part of the European Union sometimes feels a little bit protected. Well, we've, we've come to the communitarian acquis, so we therefore we are um, not to be criticized democracies. A recent study, I think Herman uh, drew my attention to that, the situation of the independence of justice, of the democratic system, of independent journalism has gone down since the joining of the European Union. So let's remain. The key question really is for all of us, whether we are entrepreneurs, government officials, citizens, journalists, it doesn't matter. The key question really is what type of society do we want to pass on to our children? That's the key thing. Listen, this is now the key thing. I think the war in Ukraine has made a, a paradigm shift. That is, we need to reassess and the Council of Europe will be, I'm sorry I'm speaking too long, but the, the, the Council of Europe will organize a, a summit of heads of state and government in Reykjavik, uh, in Reykjavik at the end of May. And the key thing is, can we reassess our willingness to protect those core values that we stand for, human rights, democracy, rule of law? It was an evidence for my parents who lived through the Second World War. But to which extent has our new generation forgotten about those basic premises that we need to keep fostering? Because if we don't, it, we're not in a linear. I thought 30 years ago that once a country would have seen the light and would have moved towards human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, that they would stay on that path. Nothing is to be taken for granted. Um, if I can just add one, one comment to you. Uh, I think as media organizations, we need to do our bit as well. 
If I were a politician, I would make, make media literacy a mandatory subject at school. Definitely. We, we need to start thinking about how the, uh, our digital devices are dictating the way we think nowadays. But I think as media organizations, we need to start also rethinking the way we operate uh, because A, it will probably help us become more relevant in, in society and, and possibly survive and fight these, these misinformation. Um, I think we, we recently we've joined, uh, I, I work for the new, oldest news organization in Malta. It, it's 90 years old. It's traditionally conservative, um, you know, the way we, we operate it. We're trying to change things because we have to change things. I believe if we don't change, irrespective of whether you're legacy or not, you will not survive in this business. So we had to invest in, in tools like fact, fact checking. You know, for the first time we, we engaged a, a fact checker. Now, it's not even a journalist. We got engaged a researcher simply in this day and age to say like, this, this politician, this prime minister, this businessman has said so and so. And it is our job to say, is that doable? Did he live up to the, did he lie? Did he cook up the figures to um, reach that kind of conclusion? And I found we've only done it for three months. Um, I believe Cyprus also introduced it recently because we form part of a Southern Mediterranean fact-checking service. And we have found our readers so far to be very receptive to this new service. We're not stating, it's not a sexy story, you know, uh, with, with great headlines, but simply ministers said, you know, cars will be able to fly in 20 years' time. And you say, what are the facts so far? What is the research so far? And will you just say, this is false. This is true. This is inconclusive. And I think sometimes we need to cut to the chase and tell people these are the facts. It's not about opinion here but stick to the facts. And I think it is important for all of us as journalists to start really rethinking the way we tell the story. Um, just on, on the point about what's being discussed in Parliament, um, I, I am sure that there are genuine motivations for doing something about this information. And for sure there is a need um, to provide the public with a kind of fact-checking service. I mean, there is certainly a need for that. But the reason why I think um, legal initiatives are the wrong instrument and these discussions are a waste of time is that it should definitely not be the job of the executive branch of government to decide what is disinformation and what isn't and to prosecute people for spreading this for what the government decides to be disinformation, right? It's certainly not the business of government to do that. It is the business, perhaps, of a public broadcaster um, or of news media to provide a fact-checking service. I mean, the, the service that the Times of Malta, where Herman is editor, is providing is done with state support, I believe, Council of Europe support or it's EU it's support? EU support, yes. EU support, sorry, third time lucky. Um, it's done with EU support. So, you know, there, there is public support which is needed for these initiatives, but it should happen autonomously of, of the executive, 100%. It should not be the job of government or civil servants to decide who is informing and who is disinforming? This would be would be really dangerous, and I would totally advise against um, going down that path. And never mind that it is probably unconstitutional um, for the government to prosecute people for expressing themselves. I mean, you 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 just can't do that. Much. I'm, I'm Gregos Pregutis. I'm a freelance uh, journalist. Matthew, I'm following the story of the assassination of Daphne for the early beginning. I have the chance to meet you in Paris a few years ago in the framework of the Association of European Journalists. 
Now I'm the media freedom uh, representative of AEJ, very close friend of William Gorslin. Patrick, Herman, whatever you said are very, very relevant of what is happening in Cyprus. Malta and Cyprus are not quite similar in, in geography in the Mediterranean. We are facing really common challenges. The only difference we have is that we didn't reach the point of killing people. But when it comes to the system of corruption, we may be in Cyprus champions and compare with the situation in Malta, which resulted to the assassination of Daphne. 7,000 golden passports were issued by the previous government. And nobody took the political responsibility for that. Now we are expecting to have an investigation from the um, uh, judicial system in Cyprus, but nobody believes that this system is reliable to confront the situation. We do believe that we have to work definitely, Patrick, on the level of the journalists themselves. It's not an issue of me, uh, through the chance of the government. The Council of Europe has to find ways, together with the European Commission, to check facts of what is happening on the ground, because journalists are silenced when it comes to corruption issues. And here we insulted from politicians. We have cases where even the president attacked journalists because they were about to ask a question about the golden passports. And the, the fact that we only started investigating really what is happening with these cases started only because of Al Jazeera investigation is a clear signal that investigative journalism is declining, is marginalized. There are only indications from alerts, and I think there is no alert coming from the government uh, control areas of the Republic of Cyprus. We have only issued some uh, media alerts for the north because of the attacks of Turkish Cypriot journalists from uh, political sources and the government of Turkey. This is not the reality. Please go directly and speak to the journalists themselves. Allow them to tell you the real story, which is not the story of the reports we have sometimes when we are paying visits in countries and they say, what is, um, what is the legislation is in force? Yes, we have the legislation, we have freedom of expression, we have media freedom. No, we do not have media freedom. A serious challenge for all member states exists. I share your view, Patrick, that we were relaxed because of the accession to the European Union, and we thought that the rule of law is for granted. This is not the case. On the contrary, we are experiencing the opposite. Year by year, media freedom is not there. And finally, I would like to call upon the government spokesman. Mr. Letin Giotis, please do a difference with the previous practices and establish again a, an appropriate briefing in this room as all the democratic governments are doing in the European Union. The formal, appropriate, the, the appropriate briefing. Ah, you don't have it as well. Oh, no. Okay, let's let the, let the spokespersons, I don't know, to uh, work together. The appropriate briefing of journalists in this room has been cancelled for 10 years. And the politicians, you know what they are doing? They have replaced the need to have this briefing stand in front of journalists and receive any question coming from 
freely and be responsible to respond. They cancelled it and they are going and participating in TV shows. They are going around and they are participating in TV shows. Mr. Lerdo, you know that there is a formal, a formal demand from the Lunar journalist, the president is here, for some years now, and you are refusing. You are refusing to do this. First of all, uh, I would like to congratulate everyone. Uh, at least for me, it was very interesting because I think I'm the only one who is not a journalist. So it's, uh, it was very essential, the, the things you mentioned. I underlined the adoption of a national action plan and uh, the implementation of legislative and other frameworks that it's our responsibility. I completely agree with uh, what I've heard, that you should talk directly with the journalists. That's the essence, I think, of this discussion. Now, if I'm going to, don't be taking your time in because I, I'm very interested in hearing that saying. I would like to inform Mr. Kiriakos, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, it would be, I think, more productive if you just waited until we finished the meetings we're having with all the press. It was uh, the first mention we're making when we're meeting with the press, and I would like to inform you that our press offices, that our press media, that they don't want to meet with the government spokesperson. We asked to meet them and they didn't want to meet us. Also, we met with uh, Mr. Yorgos uh, a, briefly, a brief uh, meeting that our first uh, priority is to re-establish the briefing. We are hearing and listening uh, suggestions so that we're making this briefing as productive and as more helpful as it can be for you, for the journalist. The briefing was cancelled in Cyprus, I think, in 2004. Or 2005, I was 20 years ago then. Uh, we are in the office now for one month, and I want to reassure you that it is often said that the politicians are public servants. We think the journalists are serving their country uh, in a much more important way. We want to have this relationship with the journalists, but we want to have this sincere relationship with the journalists. And we want to have this two-way relationship with them, not just to announce things, but we want to listen from the journalists because in many cases, in our brief stay in the, in the office, we found out that your intervention, your, um, your remarks, and in many times, in many occasions, uh, your motives are helping the government to pro producing work for, the, for their country. So just to finalize, the briefing is in our priorities, is something that we mentioned in every occasion from the first day we took office. There was a question here in this, in this room. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you can understand that uh, we need to finalize the, uh, the specifics and the place or the days or the, the format will be announced after we listen from you. That's why we're waiting until we finish these meetings. Thank you. Maybe it would be a good idea just to have the first one to listen to us and then you can arrange when you'll do it regularly. Uh, and I would like to inform you that there are some journalists that when we mentioned we want to re-establish the briefing, something I mentioned before, they told us that they don't want the briefing. No, no, it's not. It's not the TV owners. Uh, like yeah, maybe, maybe just quickly. Um, microphone on, yeah? Microphone on, is it on? Does it work? Yeah. Did the union okay. make a complaint so about the, the uh, briefing? I think what is important there is indeed, I, I think the discussion is very interesting. I think that's part of that I, I'm, I'm very great, I'm grateful to the press and information office that a discussion like this can already take place. That's very important. And at the level of the Council of Europe, um, we've had a tradition for a long time to work with civil society organizations. That is that it's not only governments. We also need to be able to talk to well, local authorities as well, 
but also to the civil society organizations. And that's in that context that we established this platform for um, journalist associations to be able to alert the Council of Europe and the governments to mishaps in the society. The Association of European Journalists that you refer to, European Federation of Journalists, Reporters Without Borders, a number of them, um, Article 19, are part of, of, of that exchange and I think that is, that is crucial that we continue to do that. It's not necessarily liked, not even by our Committee of Ministers. Because the Committee of Ministers says, would we not need to have a filter mechanism in order to have all those critical voices of those journalist associations before they're made public, that they can be filtered? For the time being, we've resisted that. We said, no, if this comes through European recognized journalist organizations and freedom of expression organizations and human rights organizations, they have to be displayed as they are. And then it's up to the governments. It's not always directed toward go towards governments because let's face it, in quite a number of, for example, demonstrations, there's also the, uh, the private actors, demonstrators that uh, assault journalists. So it's not always directed towards the governments, but it's also directed towards other actors. And I think it is important to be able to listen to that um, and to associate uh, those associations to, to what we're doing. Would you like to make a comment? Um, I have nothing to add, really. Okay. That's okay. Next question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I am also a freelancer, I'm Maria Vangelo. Uh, I always, always want to believe in the good intentions of the Council of Europe. So, uh, do you have any plans for Julian Assange, for instance? Or do we expect him to die in the jail and then to commemorate him? The, the difficulty with an international organization, and it's not only a question of of good intention. Let's face it, the Council of Europe needs to act when it comes to formal decisions with the Committee of Ministers, which are the representatives of states. And in many occasions, this does not necessarily mean that we will come to easily come to one position. It's not as if the Council of Europe has an army to be able to go into um, in, into an area and, and be able to dictate what we're doing. We intrinsically remain an intergovernmental body. And that intergovernmental body needs the decision of the countries which are part of it. It's a difficulty, um, but we cannot, in, as such, without this consent of the Committee of Ministers, go into a situation. We're not going into Poland or we're not going into Hungary and say this is how you should be doing things. But we have to be able to, with persuasion, try to change a situation. Another question? Yes, the lady there. Thank you. So, sorry, have you tried with your persuasion in this case of Julian Assange? Or of not course. yet? Of, of course, this is an item which is regularly discussed. We are also within the Council of Europe. There is what is called a group of friends of media freedom, which are ambassadors of uh, those states which are particularly concerned with uh, media, uh, media freedom and freedom of expression and the protection of journalists. We try to come to a common position there with them in order to put that forward towards the, the global decision of the Committee of Ministers. So that is being done. The lady? Yeah, um, Andrea Cadiz, Cyprus Mail. So I wanted to ask something which my colleague touched upon, where he said there hasn't been a murder in Cyprus, which I wanted to ask about. He talked a lot about attacks against journalists, whether they're violence or harassment or lawsuits, libel, but there is a whole minefield before that, which is self-censorship, 
of journalists themselves afraid to speak out, not only because of fear of violence, but even for their careers, whether they lose their job, whether even they can speak out, whether even you know where they work will allow them to carry out the press freedom. And I was wondering if you could comment on that because you know there is of course a huge need for protecting journalists from attack. But what about everything before that, which is even taking the first step? Well, if I may quickly react to that, first of all, at the level of the Council of Europe with the University of Malta, we have done two major studies. The first major study was a quantitative study by Professor Marilyn Clark, and you can find the details about that, which uh, actually was a, a questionnaire to a thousand journalists throughout Europe which analyzed uh, what are the chilling effects, what are the, uh, the consequences of the policies on the attitude of the journalist. Uh, and that was quite revealing. And it was the first scientific study that we did in this sense because there's a lot of talk about what is happening but we wanted a scientific study to put that in place. It was followed up by a qualitative study. And actually the first person to be interviewed for that qualitative study uh, was um, Matthew's mother, Daphne Caruana Galizia, who was murdered one week after that interview. Uh, nothing to do with the interview, but um, just to, to say the importance of it, that the type of journalist we... Um, we interviewed because that was the persons that were uh, extremely um, strong and resilient towards the situation that they were undergoing. Um, and we wanted to draw on that resilience to be able to see to which extent are journalists in a situation that they can effectively protect themselves and stand up and speak out um, but the reality is, is also for the bulk of journalists very different. There are economic dependencies, there is journalistic and editorial dependencies. Um, maybe also Herman can say something because he is the editor-in-chief on how to protect as an editor-in-chief from your stakeholders uh, the fact that you can still keep being uh, independent in your reporting and not to... Um, uh, undergo the the, uh, the pressures and the chilling effect that we described in those studies uh, to do that. Yeah, just, just um, minor point, um, Andrea, but we've seen, um, especially in the last few years, it is becoming very, very difficult to recruit new journalists. Um, and we've seen that especially um, in the last five years since Daphne was killed back home. Um, there are people who tell us, you know, is it worth the risk? We all know that we're overworked, underpaid for, for what we do. Um, but there is something more which we don't take notice of it. We're all being trolled, you know, till kingdom come. I've seen the best journalists being driven out of the business simply because they can't take the hatred anymore. And the fact that you become a public spectacle. And I'm afraid... That sometimes happens, at least in my country, by government-sponsored trolls. And it's very disturbing when you think about it. Because it happens, the government will say it respects the work of journalists in front of you when it has its own propaganda machine, when it has its own television station, which is basically um, targeting journalists. I've been targeted. Matthew's been targeted, his mother was targeted, um, and this is the way the machine works. And uh, it is no wonder that so many people are, are um, thinking, why should I be doing this job? Um, the best journalists in Malta, some of the best journalists I know in Malta, do not work in journalism anymore. And it's quite tragic, I think. I, I really recommend this study from the Council of Europe. It's actually written in a very easy to read form. It includes a full transcript of the interview with my mother. It's called Breaking the Wall of Silence. Um, if you just Google it, you'll find it. 
it's it's just really great and it it um it details all of these first hand accounts from journalists around Europe where they talk about everything they dealt with um and obviously including my mother you know she talks about everything that she went through um and as Patrick said the interview was six days before the murder obviously she had no idea that that was going to happen but you know she describes everything that we can now say sort of led up to the to the assassination okay uh, are there any further questions or shall we conclude the meeting thank you gentlemen so much it was um, really a very interesting discussion thank you all for having your questions i hope uh, your questions have been answered and um, you can continue the discussion uh, later on. So may I also remind you what uh, Matthew and Herman said before. Uh, tomorrow night we have this excellent uh, theatrical play and we are all looking forward to seeing you there. Tomorrow night, 8.30. Thank you for hosting us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.